In today's episode of Amir Improved, I am joined by Kyle Matthews, who is the Executive Director of the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies at Concordia University. Kyle, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. And we have a lot of things that we can talk about on today's episode, specifically what's happening around the world and uh, human rights. Uh, I've been following a lot with the Human Rights Foundation, what they've been doing, or, or Alex Gladstein. Gladstein. Mm-hmm. And uh, my question to you is for people who are interested in human rights, and obviously it's a pretty broad question because human rights in Canada versus human rights in China versus Russia, is, it's quite different, very different context. But generally speaking as a whole, as I'm a firm believer, a more educated uh, populace is a better society. The more we educate people, the better it is. And so for the general population out there who are listening to this or watching this on YouTube, what are things that people should be concerned about right now when it comes to human rights? Well, I think generally, I mean, right now, um, the coronavirus outbreak has has us all kind of focused on our own um, families, our own safety. And we're seeing some of our basic human rights, like freedom of movement, uh, being curtailed. And that's for a wider sense of good. So we're all focused on that. But if you take go back and have a bigger picture of the world, is that we, we, we are in, I think, a very challenging time for human rights. We have many Western countries um, who w- would tend to, to be unified, would support human rights norms at the UN. Um, they've... They haven't been as strong, particularly about the U.S. Uh, with President Trump. He seems not to really care about human rights. He's been siding with more authoritarian governments. So, so that's deeply troubling. And then we also have a rise of, I guess, competing um, uh, political systems around the world that really don't care about human rights. So, so one is China. Um, China, uh, which is an authoritarian, um, you know, it's a one-party state. They don't believe in individual human rights. They've locked up one one million minimum Uyghur Muslims. That's a frightening scene. In legitimate um, concentration camps. Well, they're called re-education camps, but they're basically they're there. They re-education camps. Well, that's what they call them, but people are not there voluntarily. Um, my institute has been harassed by Chinese diplomats in Canada for, for inviting Uyghur Muslim leaders uh, to speak at a university. So, so I would say that the China issue is one, it's a threat of democracies, of freedom of speech, um, access, you know, that this what the Chinese are developing, this kind of surveillance state, which is being exported around the world to Africa and to others. So, so that's one issue. And we also have, of course, um, a rise of, of um, what we call a liberal authoritarianism. And that particularly look at Russia, which, um, you know, you just look at the position of Russia, Russia at the Security Council, uh, you know, backing the Assad regime in Syria. And then we've seen, you know, the Syrian war, which is still ongoing, over, I think now, 9 million people minimum displaced, some refugees, some internally displaced, attacks on hospitals. So we have these wider issues, and then we have we have cases of now more than ever, more than 50 million um, people that are displaced around the world. That's the largest number of displaced people since the Second World War. Um, that's troubling. We have climate change that's re- resulting in, in calamities and natural disasters. Um, and we also have, you know, also I think is, is also concerning – is a shutdown and attacks against journalists. Um, you know, we yes. have many yes, states, yes. journalists, bloggers, um, and it's to shut down any any critique of of what certain governments are doing. So you put this all together, and, and I, I think we're very lucky in Canada. We you know we sometimes talk about oh yeah we've got problems here, and but our problems compared to what's going on in the rest of the world are nowhere near the same. So. We need to fight for for those hard won rights, but we also have to be vigilant about what's happening overseas because um, we can't just fall into this kind of as we self isolate that we self isolate ourselves from the wider international system. And and countries need other countries, other people around the world need countries like Canada to stand up for human rights norms and laws that we've all signed on to. Is there any kind of red flags that we should be looking out for here in Canada? Like the, one of the red flags that I saw in the United States is the uh, mili- uh, I don't know what they define it, but I'll call it the Military Act, where yeah. it's a decree. President signs it. The the, the uh, Constitution is temporarily put on the side, and it's kind of pretty much a one party system. And we can we can commandeer your property. We can do whatever we want. It's actually the Patriot Act on steroids. Whatever we want, we can do, and you can't say nothing about it. And so that's kind of like a red flag for me, but, you know, since we're Canadian, is there any uh, red flags that citizens should be looking out for, like lingo, language, or things that once they see it, that kind of uh, starts the alarm in their mind? 
Well, you know, I think we are different than the United States, but we should not be complacent. I mean, it's in um, in cases uh, where there are emergencies, um, real legitimate public health emergencies, or you know, an act of war that we have to defend ourselves. Very often, we must um, give governments powers to react more quicker than before. Um, however, I think we, you know, there are things to be concerned about. I mean, there's some talks about, um, you know, if many Canadians get sick because of the coronavirus, or some people saying that we might have to not treat anyone who's over 60. Um, and I think that's that's problematic. We start moving to a system where we are going to deny people health care based on their age. That's problematic. Um, I think we need to look at um, the rise of, of extremist groups be it on the far right or far left that start instigating uh, violence against uh, individual citizens or companies or banks. Now is a time that we actually remain unified. We don't start um, using this. And, and there are some voices out there that are, you know, anti-immigrants. They want to shut down the border. There are those that actually, you know, want to take pitchforks and go after businesses. I mean, so we got to keep, we have to keep an eye on that, but there's also the government overreach. I think if you looked at the federal government um, that last week, try to pass, you know, certain emergency power. Yeah. yeah. That tax law, and that really scared people because it basically said you're going to shut down. Um, there'll be no monitoring by the uh, by the opposition. You'll have you know powers that you can just decide who to tax and 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 when and where. What else you could take? So so I, I think I think in these times we still have to ensure that we maintain our democratic institutions and not give away too much power, at least not for a long term, <laughs> because um, yeah, um, things uh, we've seen societies across the world um, change under uh, extreme duress. Even democracies can sometimes um, go off the abyss. So, so we have to remain vigilant and, and, and hold our government to account and keep an eye about what also is going on um, overseas. We need a more game theoretical checks and balances. You know, one of the reasons why they say the tax uh, that tax proposal was shut down was because of a minority government. So you had different oppositions coming in and some challenging. Obviously, the incentive is like they want to get well. I always say follow the breadcrumbs, right? What are the incentive models? But um, it's for me, it's interesting because once you have, let's say, you know, there's a saying absolute power corrupts, absolute all. And once power is given, power is never taken away. It's not like all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, we got all this power. Well, here, you can have it back again. You know what? Yeah, well, listen, there's, you know, we, we've seen cases in Hungary. We've seen the, the Hungarian government pass emergency powers that, that basically, you know, has very vague definitions of what, someone can end up in jail for, or we see people um, uh, now being brought before the courts or put in jail for criticizing the government's response to coronavirus. I mean, we, we have to be careful. I mean, I, I, I tend to think, you know, that Canada, we are a very um, moderate country. Um, we have a st- strong institutions, so they hold each other account, but, but we have to keep an eye out for overreach. Like, you know, One thing that I don't know about is that with this whole pandemic and our economy basically going to be shut down, it could be shut down for months, if not half a year. We don't know. I I consider 2020 a write-off. It's it's done. Well, it seems to be like that, but but we're going to have major economic uh, disruptions. A lot of people put into poverty. So is the Canadian government thinking about doing this in order to take, uh, you know, extreme measures to tax corporations or to tax the extremely wealthy in order to provide some kind of um, monetary support to those hard hit, perhaps, but but we have to be very careful. I mean, um, cases from the start, you know, start of the Soviet Union to to communist states can see that sometimes, you know, overreacting and, and targeting people and taking away their private um, resources can actually backfire and, and doesn't always work. So so we we have to keep an eye out and, and not not rush into uh, into bad policy decisions when we haven't really thought things through. And so for the average person, um, is how can they participate in a system like this? Is, do they reach out to the local MPs? Do they sign petitions? Like what is our, what is the act? What is a, what is a normal day? Let's say Canadian or American can do to participate, to make the society more freer or to at least put checks and balances in. Yeah. Um, well, you know what? I, I think given what, where we are now and how we've all are, are kind of encouraged, if not soon to be forced not to actually go out in public, that now's the time to, really embrace the digital world to use social media to contact um, your uh, your MPs, interact with them to express your concerns, um, your MPs, your senators, um, and, and other people at, at the local, at the municipal and provincial level. We can do that. Um, it's also a time that if you're concerned about something, 
you know, you can uh, you can get engaged with issues, have discussions online. You can write op eds for the media, um, or you can also support organizations that are doing work that that you really believe in, and and they might not, you know, um, have a large profile. They might need your help to actually reach a wider audience. It might need help to actually fundraise and provide resources. But there's a lot of things. Now is not the time to just sit back and um, and watch Netflix twenty four seven. And for the next five, six months, it's, it's also time to think carefully and critically and, and think about uh, what, what we need to do as a society and what the role of individuals in society is. It's to, to hold people to account and, and individuals have the power to make massive, and important changes. I, I always tell people, if you look at the Second World War, if you look at, um, you know, you look at the Holocaust, for example, um, in, in Hungary, there was a Swedish diplomat, um, Raul Wallenberg, who took individual action, gave out passports to allow people to flee the country, uh, gave out food aid, and he is estimated to have saved between 80 to 100,000 people. Him by wow. himself. He saved more people during the Holocaust than any other government did. Wow. So, so the power of the individual is extremely, uh, I think that's a lesson that, that the, the listeners to your station and to your podcast, it's not forget that you can make a difference. Don't, don't be complacent. Don't think that, you know, um, I, I'm just one person. I, I will, it's always and always has been individuals that can actually bring about, you know, seismic change, dramatic change. Um, and, and I hope as we hunker down that we don't forget that. Yeah. Well, one class example, at least for Canada was, uh, the, the reason why we have federalized weed was that I forget the person's name, but he challenged in Supreme court constitutional right for medicine one person mm -hmm. he's like this is my medicine it's like how are you denying me no different than like if somebody needs uh, a, a vaccine or somebody needs some type of other medication and that i forget the person's name but be, that was kind of precipice the anchoring of the case like hey it wasn't, the, it wasn't the pot activist in vancouver mark emery was it or? no no it wasn't emery i forget who it was fuck they fucked him man threw him in jail like oh my god no, no, no. Listen, I, there were cases. I, I, I worked very close with Canadian parliamentarians. There was one Canadian. Um, his, Norm, his, his name is Norm King. He since passed away a few years ago, but he was very concerned about the crime of genocide and mass atrocity crimes around the world. So he approached a bunch of MPs in Ottawa, um, convinced them to create an all-party parliamentary group for the prevention of genocide. It was eventually chaired by Romeo Dallaire, um, and 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 he made a difference. Um, and he went on to lobby the MPs to adopt April 23rd, which is Lester B. Pearson's birthday, as a day for action against mass atrocity crimes. That's, that's one individual. And mm. from doing that, he then got, you know, a bunch of high schools in Ottawa, young people to get together and start doing advocacy work, um, you know, raising public awareness. That's an example. Like what now is, 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 is a perfect time. If you have an idea um, and you've got time on your hands, start trying to implement it and start thinking about long term term where you can make a difference what organizations would you re recommend or you suggest for people to check out you know there's uh there are a lot of great organizations depending on, on what your interests are in i mean if it's if it's on wider human rights issues we have human rights watch amnesty uh their university think tanks like mine um there's also there's more specialty ngos now looking at stuff about tech and human rights so there's an ngo in, in in uh, the U.S. called Access Now. They do a lot of work on, on tech, human rights, freedom of speech. Um, I like Article 19 in the U.K. that, that works for freedom of speech. Um, you know, th there's a lot of things. There's a, there's a group in, um, in uh, New York called Witness that they, they used to use uh, media to, uh, to document human rights abuses, and now they're doing a lot of work on artificial intelligence and mm -hmm. deep things. And a lot of the, the new... The new issues that this emerging technology is impacting society. So, so there's a lot out there, and, and sometimes you know, if you just believe in, in refugee issues and supporting refugees, then the UN High Commission for Refugees uh, is one to support. There's the Canadian Council for Refugees. There are a lot of different organizations. Um, if you're worried about political prisoners, Amnesty started off that way. You can support them. Um, I've done a lot of work also with uh, the Saudi in prison blogger Raf Badawi. Mm -hmm. um, his family live in Quebec. Um, they've got a foundation. They're always looking to make noise on Twitter because the um, the Saudi government has refused to release him uh, for was basically like a thought crime of criticizing religion. Um, you know they need support, so there, there's a there's a lot out there. Just do a little digging, go on Twitter, start following the stuff, and and also also now there's there's groups in Toronto like Journalists for Human Rights. They need support. There's there's Pen for freedom of expression. There's there's tons of organizations that need people now to help them 
um, online and also uh, in, in giving them their, their financial or political support. Kyle, thank you so much for sharing. Where can people reach you? What's the best resource? Well, yeah, so my institute, uh, MIGS, the Montreal Institute for Genocide and New Rights Studies, um, is a think tank in Montreal, Concordia University. You can look, Google us, you'll find us. You can find my email. I'm, I don't hide who I am. Uh, I'm very active on Twitter. Uh, I'm, you can find me on LinkedIn. That's how I connected it. I was following on Twitter. Yeah, well, <laughs> how it works now, especially, you know, I, I think you followed me before I was on shutdown. I'm not too sure. Yeah. Uh, but, but reach out if you're interested in an issue. Uh, we've got projects going on. We have we need support. We need we need an engaged public, both in mm. Canada and abroad. So so social media is probably the best way. Well said. Thank you, Kyle. It was my pleasure. Yeah.